It's the third session in helping us as followers of Jesus to talk with Muslim people about Jesus. Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. Previously, we've been reminded that we should replace any fear we might have of Muslims with faith in a big, strong God and replace loathing with love for Muslims as people. Muslim people made in the image of God, fallen and in need of his love. We've also thought about Islam as something of a structure and a religion, recognising that all Muslims are a little bit different and we need to find out from them what they think and believe. We looked at five pillars and six beliefs and four objections. Four objections that we should have Christian answers to. These are objections to our book and what we believe in it. But what else might Muslim people value? Again, it's speaking in general terms, but in my experience of Muslim people, certainly in this country and elsewhere, these are some things that they really do value and important for them. First of all, Muhammad as their prophet. Cartoons have shown us how highly they regard him when he is defamed in some way. But Muhammad is the one they are to emulate. The Quran says that he is their best example to follow. Now, what he did and what he said is recorded in the Hadith. And there are different collections of those. Uh, the most uh, famous and comprehensive is a guy from a guy called Bukhari and runs to about nine volumes, about this big, and is available in most good Islamic bookshops. And it explains something of his life and it gives Muslim people more detail. So the Quran, for example, doesn't say that you are to pray five times, but the Hadith says that, and it shows you what you are to do. It tells you how to get dressed, that you are to put your right foot into your right shoe first and things like that. It provides more detail. It also provides more comfort. So it says things like if you go to a mosque to pray and you do it properly, you don't upset anybody else, then you'll be forgiven your sins for that week. But it also provides more fear. It says things like the majority of the inhabitants of hell are women. And there's a hadith that talks about out of Adam, God brought white people from his right shoulder who will go to paradise. And out of his left shoulder, he brought black people who will go to hell. But Muhammad is the supreme example for Muslim people to follow. What he did, people are to do. And he becomes the interpretive key for the Quran. So lots of the Quran is quite hard to understand because it's, it's based on what's happening in Muhammad's life. And Muhammad's life is recorded in the hadith and you need that to understand the Quran. So what do people value? Well, first of all, they value Muhammad as their prophet and the one they are to follow. Now, what else? Well, not so much what they might value, but what might be important in their lives, the spiritual forces. In the West, we often think that, that God is in control of everything as believers, and that's fine. They're all safe. But for Muslim people, they often think that, that God is very distant. He's out there. He's absent. And I am here. And there's this middle space of spiritual forces that affects what happens. Now, we, of course, as Christians, believe in spiritual forces. But we often don't talk about them, but Muslim people often will. So one, uh, for example, one friend of ours, she was growing coriander for her husband's curry house. And the first year they grew very well. The second year, a neighbor came around and admired the coriander and said, what great coriander you're growing. And the next week it died. And as our friend was telling us this, she said, that's because our neighbor put the evil eye on her coriander. Now, as a Westerner, I think, oh no, what nonsense. There's a scientific, rational explanation for this. A snail or a slug at the coriander. And that may well be true. But my friend would say, why did the snail or slug come? It was because of an evil force that was created by her neighbour's envy. It was an envious eye that caused this coriander ultimately to die. Now, I could just poo-poo that say, well, it's just nonsense, but it doesn't actually lead to Jesus. And actually, it's not part of a Christian worldview either. There are spiritual forces. Far better to talk about Jesus having power over all evil, to talk about a story from the Gospels, maybe when he uh, casts out the demons from Legion, to talk about his great power. And therefore, we don't need to fear evil forces. Not least because ultimately they were conquered when Jesus died and rose again, disarming them at the cross. Also, if you look in Scripture, we have envy and evil spirits linked, for example, with David and Saul. It's interesting that those two are linked there. Often an Islamic worldview is similar to a worldview in the Bible. That's not to say it's a biblical worldview, 
But things that happen in the Bible are often seen in the Muslim world, amongst Muslim friends too. Thirdly, what might uh, Muslim people value? Well, often the group over the individual. For us, well, I think, therefore I am, as a good Westerner. But for many Muslim people brought up in a different cultural background, I belong, therefore I am. The group is really, really important. And what I do reflects upon the group. I can damage the group, but also I can bring honour to the group as well. And the leader of our group can both bring honour and shame. And if he is dishonoured in some way, I must fight for his honour. That in part explains something of the response to cartoons and other things. When the leader is defamed, he must be honoured to show that that defamation has gone in some way. Again, to a Western mindset, that might just seem illogical, silly even. But actually, what does the Bible say about groups and honour and shame? Well, it's full of honour and shame. Back in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve are ashamed to appear before God. Wonderfully looking forward, Jesus scorned the shame of the cross to bring honour to his people. And he brings honour to his people, those who are included in him. It's a group mentality. He is the head of us as believers. Adam is the head of all humanity and brought us into sin and death. But the Lord Jesus brings those who are his into life. So maybe a group orientation is a little bit more biblical at times than us thinking individualistically. And maybe talking about Jesus as our leader, as our head, as the one who brings honour to his people is a helpful thing to talk about. Now your Muslim friends may value other things, but why not ask them about Muhammad, about his example and how they're to follow that, what it means for them. And maybe then talk about Jesus as our supreme example, what it means for us to be following him, his teaching particularly in the Sermon on the Mount, those kinds of teaching and how we're to follow him. And we need nothing more. We don't need teaching outside of the Bible to follow Jesus. It's all there for us. And secondly, thinking of spiritual forces, I mentioned about Jesus casting out legion. Well, why not learn stories from the gospel that you can just share with Muslim friends? Learn them properly, not just the odd sentence as a summary, but, but almost what it is verse for verse so you can share that and then talk about it with Muslim friends. Talk about how Jesus will conquer Satan completely at the end. Go to Revelation, for example. Why not talk about his temptation, that he alone conquered Satan there? Didn't give in to temptation, unlike Adam and Eve and everybody else since. That Jesus has conquered spiritual forces and we don't need to fear because of his death and resurrection and his return. And finally, again, talking about group orientation, talk about Jesus that he is our head, that included in him we are safe. Talk about the kinds of things that Romans 5 talks about. We might find it hard to understand, but he is our head, the perfect head, who never puts his people to shame and doesn't actually mind, in a sense, being shamed. That when he was shamed by his enemies and beaten and hurt and killed, he said, Father, forgive them. So they might join his people and they might be forgiven to and be with him forever. Thanks for watching. See you next time.